since 2003. This is the Sports Source with your host, John Pennington. The Sports Source is presented by Junk Be Gone, Pipe Wrench, and the Garza Law Firm. The Sports Source starts now. Good Sunday morning and welcome. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong spot. Happy Halloween week uh, from the Sports Source. Uh, welcome into the Junk Be Gone Studios. We have a good show for you today. Although it is a bit of a skeleton crew, it's not going to be the normal 10 or 15 people we put on one of our Sports Source extravaganzas today. We, due to illness and people out of town and everything else, it's going to be three or four of us. But we do have Mark Pankratz coming in. That means we're not only going to be talking about what we saw in the SEC yesterday, what we are seeing in terms of the college playoff race in Tennessee football, what they've got coming up with Kentucky. We're also going to be talking Tennessee basketball because they have an exhibition against Indiana today at 3 o'clock. We'll get you up to date on their newcomers and stuff like that. Let's just dive right in. First segment of our program today is brought to you by Junk Be Gone. And as soon as the football season ends and I get a day off, I am having Junk Be Gone out to my house. Never got time to clear out my garage, my storage room, boxes and other nonsense this year so i'm doing it next month just in time for christmas when i'll be bringing in more stuff use junk be gone to unclutter your home i know you're sitting there thinking well they can only do that for a huge job no trust me if you're like me and i know a lot of you are because i see amazon delivering boxes for your neighborhood for your front door the same as mine those boxes load up well junk be gone hauls them away and they get rid of everything in an environmentally friendly fashion junk be gone dot biz all right let's welcome in the rest of the panel that's pretty much it today except for mark pankratz <laughs> is showing up we got bob hodge right there we got vince ferrara right here we got tyler Evans right here i like the pink thank you John. just looking um, to be better than the skeleton with our th that's right yeah poor old <laughs> nothing but bones. poor old slim the uh, be sports or skeleton <laughs> he's, he's he's been brought out for much worse occasions though usually oh, yeah. it's like i remember when when butch jones we, we finally said okay that's the one that got him <laughs> <laughs> he makes an appearance. Coaches don't like seeing Slim show up on our set. All right. Uh, the SEC rolled on with six games yesterday. Tennessee, one of only four league teams that didn't play. Let's take a look at the scoreboard. And I want to ask you. All right. So you got Alabama, which that thing was six to nothing until late in the first half. Mm -hmm. Offense looked terrible again. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, do I need to reevaluate Tennessee's defense for the 14th straight game. Everybody they play then stinks the next week. Maybe that's Tennessee showing everybody how to defend them. But Alabama does blow Missouri out, Missouri fading fast. Uh, Texas, 27-24. Now, it was 27-17, but Vandy does not quit. And they got a heck of a quarterback in Diego Pavia. Arkansas puts away Mississippi State. Ole Miss struggled with Oklahoma for a while, but finally put them in the bag. The game of the day yesterday was LSU building a nice big lead on Texas A&M and then Texas A&M coming out of nowhere in the second half. And then Kentucky laid down and died against Auburn. And we'll be talking about Kentucky's in here next week. It's been announced that's a 745 start. Uh, it's right here on its ABC game, correct? 745 right here? Uh, or is it the ESPN? SEC Network, yeah. Is it SEC Network? Yeah, okay. Texas A&M, South Carolina, is that ABC? That's right, that's right, yeah. So, but it's still 745. Right. Uh, so a night game, Auburn, Kentucky, I mean, Tennessee, Kentucky next week. We'll talk about UK and the Vols a little late, but I want to ask you guys, and I'll start with Bob, what surprised you yesterday? If, if you're looking at the individual games, game by game, the biggest surprise in any of those games was what happened to LSU in the second half mm -hmm. against Texas A&M. Um, like you said, they had a good lead. I did not think that Texas A&M was going to have the offense to be able to come back. I didn't think that Texas A&M's defense would suddenly just rise up and, and look like the purple people eaters. And that one was the biggest shock. And you sat there and you looked at it and you watched their quarterback in the second half. And excuse me, I'm sorry, I've, I've forgotten his name. There's a lot of names to remember and all this <laughs> stuff. But the kid will virtually unstoppable. I haven't paid that much attention to Texas A&M this mm -hmm. year. So I go and I look. Oh, he's played in three other games. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't been very good. And yet yesterday he was th through two passes in mm -hmm. the second half. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so that was my biggest surprise was half-to-half -half LSU and Texas A&M. 
Uh, I agree with that game. The way it turned around, no answer for Marcel Reed. Mm. And four straight touchdowns they scored once they changed quarterbacks. Now, the first one was one play running out on an RPO where yeah. Nussmeyer uh, turned the ball over and tried some hero ball. But Marcel Reed, actually, I didn't think that they should change quarterbacks when Marcel Reed was in there because mm. he gave them that running threat back when, uh, when Wegman was hurt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then when Wegman came back, they started winning games. They're like, okay, yeah. Mike Elko knows what he's doing with his quarterbacks. Well, he made a decision in there, and Wegman was not happy about it, and it turned out, and now Marcel Reed is their quarterback because there was no, no answer. But he can't throw until, until that's the next week. He can't yeah. throw. Yeah, that's the kid. He, made a, he had he a barely, long throw. He, uh, down oh, the field he the hit one. <laughs> okay, he's barely well, a fifty. Not everybody's hitting passes down the field. Barely a fifty percent passer when he's played. <laughs> well, my thing is this: yeah. I think they've got to. Obviously, they're going to keep flipping them the rest of the way. Yeah. It seems to me. I mean, you thought Wegman was your guy. I think Reed's the guy. Mm-hmm. I, neither one of them has claimed the job and stuck to it. So I, I just, it's funny. We'll talk about biggest surprises of the season a little bit later. I think went into this season, Texas A&M has a good roster. We knew that. Mm-hmm. And right now they're sitting atop the SEC, which yep. we'll get to in the next segment. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. But I don't know if they're going to stay up there at the top of the league because I don't trust their quarterback situation because you said it. No. This guy looked fantastic in the second half yesterday. What's he done earlier this season? I, I just – I don't and know. And, I mean, that, he's been fine. I don't, I got, mean, yeah, right. I don't know that they've got he has guy. But he I'm hasn't saying. been what he was in the if, second if, half if, last night. If you're in yeah. week nine and you're still flipping quarterbacks, yes, that tells me something about your quarterback situation. Anyway, go ahead. You've got two options if you're in College Station right now, conservative with Wigman or you have explosiveness with Reed. It's just that simple. And, 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 and I know some people go, well, how simple is it? They're going to have to go into every game moving forward, Texas A&M will. Because coming up, we're going to talk about Atlanta and Mm -hmm. who's going to be these teams that are a factor. They're going to have to decide every day, red pill, blue pill, because this is going to be the dynamic of the defenses I'm going to be facing off against. There have been times this year, Reed needed to play against Florida. The blew him out in the second half in that game of the Swamp. I don't think that Wigman, if healthy, could have won that game for them. I think coming up, though, if Reed wants to play this dangerous, let's throw caution to the win approach like November 30th against Texas – my opinion, I think this is a perfect Wigman spot because he's conservative, doesn't give second opportunities to oppositions. Again, it's going to be week by week, but right now things are playing out well in College Station. Bigger surprise, Vandy hanging with Texas after they beat Alabama a few weeks ago or Kentucky just laying down and dropping dead? Oh, wow. Oh, Bigger <laughs> surprise. It's a tough question. It is a tough question. Um, I would say I would say as, as bad as Kentucky looked at home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, They've now lost seven consecutive SEC home games. <laughs> home wow. games. And when they've looked better, it's actually been on the road against some really good teams, even getting the win at Ole Miss. But to look that way, obviously the quarterback position, they've got, they got a lot of problems. they got a lot yeah. of problems. You blew a 10-point lead that you had in the first quarter against Auburn. And Auburn, since Hugh Freeze has been there, they don't finish. Yeah. I mean, that is their that is their bugaboo is yep. man they've looked good for three and a half quarters mm-hmm. and they don't finish and then once they got ahead yesterday just flipping back and forth between games I never thought yeah I'm watching this for a little bit Kentucky can come back no once they got behind <laughs> Kentucky yeah. was toast yeah they botched the end of that first half yeah and didn't get, and, didn't and, get any and points yeah. and they still overcame it. Yeah, I believe we were on this show maybe it was near that last open date Kentucky beats Ole Miss in Oxford. And you sat here and you go, anybody can beat anybody on Saturday. Yeah. And I was like, he's 100% yeah. right. Except Kentucky, who then since they've won in Oxford, has gone Vandy, <laughs> Florida. <laughs> and then last night they get whooped up on Auburn. I Remember when they thought that they had the right coach stay whenever Calipari left for Arkansas, this battle of Mitch Barnhart's athletic department? Yeah. Kentucky's in bad shape right well, now. Well, you yeah, also throw still. in the three-point loss to Georgia. If you have a competent had. quarterback that named Brock Vandergriff, I think you beat Georgia that night. You well, know? here's the thing. I just and then you get trashed, blown up by South Carolina at home. I mean, that's yes. a team that's up and down. You say they can't beat anybody right now. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Yeah. I just. I mean, no. these teams tend to turn it on and turn it off week uh, to right. week. I mean, I watched the end of Nebraska Ohio State yesterday, and it all seems to be happening in these two major conferences: Big Ten, the SEC, more than anywhere else. But. They were talking about the fact that there was the same broadcast crew watching this game, and Nebraska had a late lead. And they're saying, we saw no signs of this last week when Nebraska was just getting killed. Yeah, and I think that's kind of what you get in college football, at least mm-hmm. in the major conferences now, is you have no sign from week to week. Again, I've said this on the show. People are tired of hearing me say it. I've said it for years. Lou Holtz famously said, you never see the same team twice as a coach. Justin Hamilton, when he was here, said, man, if I had the answer to that, if I knew why you didn't get the same team twice, I would still be – 
a defensive coordinator mm-hmm. in a power five. Of course, he's in the NFL, so he's doing all and, right. And this year, you're not getting the same team half to half. Sure. You right. watch the first half, Oklahoma, yeah. Ole Miss. Yeah. Man, Oklahoma is going to get them yeah. a good win Tennessee here. Tennessee fans Miss agree with that the last three weeks. And then yeah. you turn on the second half, and yeah. Oklahoma's getting sacked every time they snap the ball. So it's not only game to game. It seems like half to half the whole the, thing uh, changes. Let me give you the, the, the Halloween horror for Tennessee. This, this would be the absolute worst. Let's say you go to Georgia and you somehow beat Georgia. And then you ride pretty into Nashville. Oh, and that, oh no. Because here's the thing. Anybody saying, well, they can't beat Tennessee. Oh, they no. went on a stretch where they beat you seven out of 15 years. They also have beaten Alabama already, and they hung with Texas. I can't believe I'm saying it because I'm the one who wants them thrown out of the conference. <laughs> but if they can believe, if they can be this kind of a football program, yes. it's dangerous. On it. Okay, fine. I'm yeah, the that. last touchdown but made it that, seem closer than the score. But, but wouldn't that be the worst? They were there with Texas the entire game. But that's worst-case scenario. I mean, is that not Tennessee's worst-case scenario? If that's your Halloween that is horror, beyond worst if you case lose to scenario. Georgia, it's one thing. But if, you, if you're riding, you're looking, you're going to be a top-four seed if you get past Georgia and you're all the yeah. way winless to the last game, and then you're in Nashville in a tough game against Vanderbilt. Well, and it may keep you out of Atlanta right. in that scenario, and yeah. then it puts it on the committee. Are they giving you more credit for wins, or are they docking you for the losses? Uh, okay. All right. Very good. When we come back, let's take a look at the SEC race heading toward Atlanta. We'll show you the schedules of all the major contenders. You've got eight teams, I think. I'll look it up. Uh, We'll show you in a second. It's either seven or eight that have two losses or fewer in the SEC that are still in it. With Texas A&M, the lone undefeated team in conference play. Come on back. We'll show you the race. Welcome back. This segment of the Sports Source brought to you by A.G. Hines Company. As winter approaches, folks, remember, any project you start in the winter is going to need cold weather materials. You can't just build it with the stuff you have. If you bought something back in June, you can't use it to build your cold weather project. That wouldn't be very smart. Get down to A.G. Hines Company. They carry all the cold weather materials you could possibly need. They also have um, all the tools you could need. Gordon Hines, his family, and his entire team down there, great people. Check them out this week, aghines.com, if you want to look them up online. All right. I want to uh, do our poll question here right off the bat today. We're talking football and the poll question. What has surprised you the most about Tennessee this season? you got four chances or four choices. The improved secondary, which is winning right now, people online voting, the improved secondary, average pass attack, Sampson's production, Heupel winning with D. And right now it's improved secondary, followed by Heupel winning with D, followed by average pass attack. And not one person says they are most surprised by the fact that Dylan Sampson is on pace for school record yardage and pretty much school record carries. All right. Get your uh, phones out. Play the QR code. Just snap a photo right there. Well, you don't snap a photo. Just put your camera on it. Click it, it'll take you to our website. Uh, you can also just go to our website, sportsource.tv, and hit the uh, polls button. You can go right there and vote. We love tracking this thing, so keep, uh, keep playing with us, please. All right. Tyler, let's take a look at the eight SEC teams with two or fewer conference losses. We'll leave that up for a second here because we're going to be discussing it. That's one where uh, I'll tell my director that we're going to be coming back to that, probably back and forth to us. So let's have that always on, on call there. It has been since 2007 that at least one SEC team didn't enter November unbeaten, and they all have a loss at this point. It's been a while. But in terms of SEC play, there is one that is unbeaten, Texas A&M, 5-0 in the league, which they had the loss to Notre Dame early, and you kind of thought, oh, well, same old Texas Mm A&M. Not since then. So here's what we got. I want to know who the – is the race to Atlanta simple? And, Tyler, I'll start with you. Uh, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Missouri, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Texas, Texas A&M, all those teams with two or fewer losses. What are you looking at here for the SEC race? You, we were talking in between the break. You think sure. it could just be simple. It could come down to almost like a semifinals type thing. Yeah, the last two teams, the two Texas teams, they've been trying to chomp at the bit to get at each other, and they got to wait all the way till November the 30th. A&M's win head up last night against LSU gives them the catbird seat. If you are Texas, Texas A&M. If Texas A&M is able to go down, I beg your pardon, if A&M's at home able to knock off their bitter rival in Texas, you then go back to Atlanta and you have a rematch of what we just had eight days ago in Austin when Georgia whooped up on Texas and it was more of a first half, first three quarters game. Now, I think there are a lot of people out there who 
have seen these conferences and the new realignment and go, we're just going to get this game all over again. At least that's what the Big Ten thinks. Ohio State, Oregon, let's get it again. It, Texas A&M, they can be the only thing standing in between a rematch between Georgia and Texas. And there are some people who are anxiously awaiting what would happen if Quinn Ewers maybe showed up ready to play, unlike he did eight days well, ago. Well, you guys know me. I'm Mr. Positive. Tennessee could jump in there, too, and yeah. mess up that. I mean, Tennessee could beat Georgia. Could. I think you could be, if you're a Vol fan, look at that. I mean, it could be winner of Tennessee-Georgia versus the winner of Texas-Texas A&M. Yep. If Tennessee-Georgia, Texas, and Texas A&M take care of all the other business. If, um, if, if you look at these teams – and you look at the schedules, are you back uh, – the conversation just a few weeks ago, does, does the SEC get four? I think you're kind well, of back in that conversation. Okay, we're going to get into the college football playoff next. I want to talk about just the SEC race. Yes, the SEC race, I think it does come down to Tennessee and Georgia. If Tennessee holds serve, which Lord knows holding serve now in college football is not the easiest right. thing in the world. Sure. And I think it does come down to Texas – and Texas A&M, if once again they both do what they're supposed to do. But next week, is anybody going to be shocked if Texas A&M goes to South Carolina and struggles? Wouldn't, wouldn't shock me. No, it wouldn't shock me. I, wouldn't shock me if Kentucky comes in here and – It gives Tennessee it again. a ball game. Remember, your offense has not looked good yeah, in exactly. a while. So the idea of it being a tight game, yeah. at least at the end of the half, is not going to surprise me a lick, even though Kentucky's looked terrible the last couple of weeks. So I just think all these games are kind of up for grabs. Um, let's put the let's put the schedule back up for folks. Go ahead. And Tyler. I'll just say this, and I'm glad that we have all eight up here because we have an idea of what it looks like with five weeks ago. My personal opinion: if there are two losses on this grid right here, this calendar, I think you're already eliminated. So you need to yeah. be looking yeah. at two and three Georgia, LSU, but LSU is kind of behind the eight ball because of the loss last night, and then your last three, which is Tennessee, Texas, and A and M. And it goes back to what you already said, John. It could essentially be. How does Georgia Tennessee fare? How does Texas Texas A&M? Fare? The only reason I put the two lost teams on there is because it's a new setup this year. Yep. It's not about the record. It's about who the two highest ranked Correct. teams are. So if Georgia loses, let's let's say Georgia loses by one point to Tennessee, mm -hmm. they're going to drop. But if all else plays the same way, would the, might they still be the second highest rated team in? In the SEC, which would put them in Atlanta. Technically, it's possible. And Alabama has the feather in the cap of beating Georgia, yeah, and that's so a nice little poker chip to have. For a team that's yeah. got two. Yes, well, exactly. you also got, Vince, I'll let you finish. we got to be quick here. Well, I, I agree that, that chalk is the simplest way to look at it. But, I mean, th these ifs are big. I mean, we've seen a bunch of ifs yeah, in sure. the first half of the season. The other thing is is – no tiebreakers? Like, what, what if what I mean, if it's... There's a thousand of them, but... Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about a bunch of teams that could be really bunched up together. Then it could get into even more tiebreakers to settle those two positions. Mm -hmm. So that that's another thing that could complicate complicate things, especially if A&M drops a game they're not supposed to, or even if they don't, yep. if they have the one loss to, to Texas, and maybe Texas trips up before yeah. that. Who's going to be shocked if Georgia goes to Ole Miss and struggles in two weeks? All right. yeah. When we come back, how do the Vols stand in the college football playoff hunt? After yesterday's action, we'll discuss that next. Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by... Uncle Jim's River Cove Campground, a fantastic campground right on the Little Pigeon River. Great for RV camping, too. There's a dog park, fire pits, picnic tables, charcoal grills, golf carts, a stocked camp store, coin laundry facility, a bathhouse, and I'm guessing that's not the Turkish kind. <laughs> Rivercovecampground.com, folks, that's where you need to go. They've got everything you could possibly want. Plus, it's only 10 minutes from every major attraction, attraction in, in the area up there. Anything you could possibly want, they got you covered. I mean, I'm telling you, rivercovecampground.com, and it's new, which means while so many other campgrounds were already booked up for the fall, they're not. They've still got some openings. Maybe, maybe. We've been, we've been talking about it here for a couple of weeks now, so maybe those openings are closed up, meaning you better get to rivercovecampground.com today to take advantage of all those spectacular amenities, River Cove Campground. All right. First of all, before we go into the next segment, these guys said, just move on. I'm not moving on. I screwed up. In my head, for some reason, I'm thinking it's about the, the rankings, that that was going to be – that was the talk early on when you go to these 16, 18-team conferences. But they, the SEC put out a thing of tiebreakers. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the rankings. It's the tiebreakers. These guys were too kind to say, hey, no, that's not right. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, when we come – or when we come back uh, – <laughs> This was the college football playoff as of yesterday. 
Actually, let's skip that. We're just going to move ahead. I'm just going to show you today. No need to show you yesterday and how it's changed. We'll just show you what you got today. This is the athletics projection for the college football playoff. There you go. I'll lift it up. Mm -hmm. Oregon 1, Miami 2, Georgia 3, Kansas State 4. Here. Penn State, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Texas, Indiana, Clemson. Tennessee is in at 11, Boise State 12th. The teams that are just outside, Alabama, Iowa State, BYU, SMU, Texas A&M down there at the very bottom. What sense does that make? I mean, I'm guessing no, that this is They're only this... losses to a team that's in the top 12. Yes, but this is Austin Mock's projection. This Whatever. is his computer deal. Uh, Heather Denich put out her list uh, of ESPN, and this is how she thinks the first rankings are going to look when they come out. And you see Tennessee 12th. You can take that. There you go. We can put them both up here together. If we can go to the wide shot, there we go. See, they're both there together. Anyway, Tennessee 12th on ESPN's list, 11th on the athletics list, meaning as of today, they're in. As of yesterday, they weren't. So by not playing, they're now in the playoff. My question, guys, how do you feel about their chances, Vince, about Tennessee's chances right now? Georgia's the only game out there that looks to be a, uh, a loss on the road if you go down there and, and fall apart. Um, you could be 10-2. and two. Mm -hmm. Are you getting in at 10-2? and two? I don't think it's an absolute. I think there's been this narrative that a 10-2 and two SEC team is getting in. I don't think that's an automatic. And with Tennessee's schedule and the teams that they have played, especially non-conference and then the conference opener, them not being as good, I don't think this schedule is a lock schedule at 10-2. and two. And they got to they gotta play better in addition – because then you start getting into the rankings. What we don't know yeah. is what the committee is going to think there about these teams versus what we're seeing from the rankings. We mm -hmm. think that's what it's going to be like, but it, it may be very different. They may not like Tennessee as much, or they may like BYU or Clemson better. Well, supposedly, yeah. they take. everyone seems to think that based on past history, they're going to take bigger eyeballs and put them on who you beat. As mm -hmm. opposed to your losses, it's – who did you beat? Who beat the best teams? Mm -hmm. If that's the case and you're 10-2, and two, you better hope Alabama finishes strong because that's right. really your only good win to this point. I really think that in the probably about a month ago I said Tennessee was a lock at 10-2. and two. Mm -hmm. I don't think so anymore mm -hmm. because everybody plays bad, bad teams. But if you start looking at the other teams you're competing against, Kent State and Chattanooga are bad, 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 bad teams. And Whoops. UTEP is still you. to come. And UTEP is still to come, but I hadn't even got them that far yet. Oh, sorry. So I really, I really think before I was kind of blowing it off that that would hurt Tennessee. But now I think that could come back and bite you in the butt simply because there looks like there's going to be so much 10 and 2 ism mm -hmm. out there. Vince, you brought up a great point. Tennessee has three top 25 wins. How many people are looking at Oklahoma and NC State right now in those top right. 25 wins? Well, going supposedly by? that's it. Yeah, the the that. playoff committee does not look at it as what their ranking was when you beat them. Supposedly <laughs> it's what are they at the end of the year. Yeah. And that's, that means the NC State and Oklahoma so, wins. So mix aren't that in wins. with those UTEPs, the Chattanooga yes. and Kent States. Um, who's keeping Tennessee out? Who had the Big 12 still with two teams? Iowa State and BYU, and who had Clemson and Cabe Klubnick fighting each other and going, hey, let's go out and compete in the ACC. you got to ask yourself, does a, let's say Miami doesn't suffer their first loss until the ACC title game. Let's say one of these other teams, BYU, Iowa State, doesn't suffer their first loss until we get to the Big 12. There's one little aspect of this, and maybe you guys can help me figure it out. This is still live drama television. If you're a committee member, do you go, 11 and 1 BYU or 10 and 2 Tennessee. 10, 10 and 2 Tennessee. Uh, to lost Clemson or Tennessee. ESPN still likes people to view it. I don't uh, know. I, see, that's I why I need your help on I work, this. I, work, I just don't buy it. I don't, I don't think, I mean, look, I, I can go back to talking to Kirk Herbstreet about the year that Peyton Manning got Charles Woodsoned for the Heisman. They weren't. Tra it's like, well, they wanted the guy from Michigan. No, they didn't. They wanted eyeballs on the selection, on the uh, announcement. That was it. So they promoted the announcement. Nobody was trying to win that. I don't think that these, I don't think that these uh, conferences are kneeling just because ESPN says put these teams in. I don't think so. I, I think the, I think the people who choose it choose it. But I'm also not a conspiracy theorist. So 
uh, which puts me out of line with most people in America these days. Guys, everybody is going to watch the playoff anyway. They don't need to manufacture I, exactly. specific teams. I hear that, but at the same time, that's why it was a small factor to go back yeah. to. Okay, so if that's completely next. Where, who are the teams Tennessee needs to be watching out for? Every week, watch Clemson, Miami football. Every week, watch BYU. Nice yep. little win against UCF yesterday. Yep. And watch what Iowa State's doing, who had an yep. open date yesterday. Well, and, and, and here's the only thing about the eyeball test. Half the teams that get in are going to be teams that attract a lot of eyeballs. Mm -hmm. So say BYU is not a big attraction on television. Mm -hmm. But they play Clemson, mm -hmm. which is an attraction. Or they play Texas, which yeah. is an attraction. So in a sense, I don't think those teams will get penalized simply because half the half of the bracket is going to be big name, yeah. widely followed football teams. You know what and I'm it's going to be the I just don't we'll beat, beat Georgia, and all this is if yeah. they are tended to for anybody who's listening yeah. right now, yeah. Tennessee yeah. controls their own destiny. Go five and zero in November, and we don't have to sit here and sweat this out. Well, see, that's right. I think if you go to the SEC championship game after you beat Georgia, I don't think it matters what happens. Then you are in fair. But there is a there is a space here. If, if all these other teams start losing and you wind up, if there are a bunch of two loss teams and somehow you make the SEC title game, there's a chance that you don't want to go. That you want to just avoid it. I think if you're yeah. eleven and one, you're okay. No, I said if you lose to Georgia oh, yeah. and all these okay. other teams, if if the tumblers oh, yeah. trip around and you're a two loss team, there's a chance you don't want to. Oh, go in that your case, yes. Loss. If you oh, are a two yeah. loss, if team, a two yes. loss team makes it to Atlanta, you don't yeah. want to be. Getting your third one down there, I wouldn't want to put that one to the test. All right, when we come back, Mark Pankratz joins us to talk about the Vols' new basketball roster. Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Southeast Termite and Pest Control. Folks, I always get the fall invader treatment. I've been encouraging you to do so for the last few weeks, but you also might need one just last normal pest treatment for the year. Spiders and all kinds of other critters are trying to get inside your home before it gets too cold. Turn to Southeast Termite and Pest Control for all your pest control needs. Great people, great company. Find them online, southeasttermite.com. I've been using them for years. You should too. Mark, you're familiar with the Haynes family. Good people, no? Oh, great people. There Do we, great work, too. There we go. Mark Pankratz right here. Former Tennessee basketball assistant coach, former uh, Division I basketball player himself at Milwaukee. Are, are they back to being Wisconsin, Milwaukee now, or is it just Milwaukee? I think they like going by Milwaukee. It makes okay. you, it makes you feel better. You take the hyphen out of yeah, the name, you, no. you feel better. All right, very good. Uh, I want to put up – we're just going to dive into this quickly. Tennessee's got a game coming up at 3 o'clock today, exhibition against Indiana. Uh, it's, it's amazing. They they now play like fifteen non conference games as yeah. the schedule is stretched, but we got to work in exhibition games in front of that too now. So let's take a look at the roster. This is some of the turnover from last year. On the left, you see the teams list. I mean the players listed by how many minutes they got. So it goes all the way down to Cameron Carr, who didn't even play an hour of time last week, uh, last year. You see the power. I mean the uh, points per game right there as well. And then you see the guys who are back: Ziegler, Ganey, Mayshack, Estrella, Phillips, Carr. Then you bring in the newcomers. Lanier from North Florida. Boswell is a four-star freshman. Probably wouldn't expect him to get a lot of time. Lanier, Milicic from Charlotte, Dubar from Hofstra, Akpara from Ohio State. Mark, you've been over there and you've seen these guys. Uh, give people a thumbnail sketch on what they can expect from some of the newcomers, how they're going to be used, and what you anticipate. Well, I think it's going to start from a scoring standpoint, Chaz Lanier. They're going, to, they're going to talk about his ability to replace Dalton Connect, and he can score at all three levels. He's a big body, can catch and shoot, uh, can shoot the pull-up jump shot. I think this offense will fit him because you put guys, which we'll get to these other guys, but you put guys around Zakai who can make passes. Chaz is a guy, because of his ability to score all three levels, if teams are going to have to switch on him, he can take advantage of those switches by shooting over the top, using his big body to get to the rim, or knock down consistent three-pointers. Probably not fair. It, it makes sense that he would be the scorer, the, the, the first option to replace Dalton Connect. But in terms of actually replacing point for point Dalton Connect, that's a lot to ask. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I think actually it's going to come down to Zakai offensively because in preseason, you know, they, they, in these secret scrimmages, they apparently yeah. they did really well against Davidson. I go over there and practice, and Zakai's out there making great passes. But the team's working on their defense at this point of the season. When you get into to league play, 
the, 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 the code is out, right? Don't help off Zakai. Make him finish. Make him score over the top. And if teams do that, Zakai's got to show his ability to be able to knock down consistent jump shots and then be able to finish at the rim to get these other new guys involved. All right, let's talk about uh, who else you've liked so far out of the new guys you've seen. What stood out to you? You talked Lanier. What about Milicic, Dubar, Akpara? Any of these guys standing out for a specific well, reason? I think Akpar is one another one because Adu leaves. That's a big hole. Yeah. Um, and I think Akpar coming in, you're not going to get the offensive prowess, but when you put the ability for this team to defend on the perimeter, mm -hmm. when, when you look at Ziegler and, and Ganey and Meshack, who's arguably the best defender in the league, and now you got a rim protector in Akpar, that makes your defense at elite, elite levels. And so I think his ability will, will fill that gap with Adu. Um, and then Igor. Uh, Igor's a guy that if teams do help off, his ability to shoot the basketball at 6'10 from the perimeter with that space and the way that we play in tempo and guys being able to get to the rim, uh, he, he can be a difference maker. And Dubar, thoughts? Uh, Dubar, you'll, if you go over to practice, you'll hear a coach say time and time again, they call him Stone. Stone, if you can't defend, you're not going to play. And so offensively, <laughs> he, offensively, he can, can add value. But if he doesn't learn the defensive concepts, it's going to be hard for him to get in that rotation early in the year. All right. Talk to me about uh, – It's fine. we're going to get into the next segment about prognostications and expectations and all that kind of thing because it's kind of strange in the portal world. But when you look at this team, last year you could count on the fact that they were a very veteran squad. I mean, with Josiah Jordan-James, with Santiago Vescovi, you had a lot of minutes built up over the years. Um, you lose that experience. Yeah. Now you're putting together – uh, you're, you're not just bringing in Dalton Connect and Jordan Ganey with a group, with a core that's been there forever. You're kind of replacing the core with a bunch of new guys. Yep. How difficult is that for Rick Barnes to do this year? I think it's difficult, but his track record proves that he's able to keep that culture despite the, the ins and outs, and I think that's what separates. Uh, you know, I've always talked about for years it was always you're, you're going to count on your veterans because of their ability to, to, to play at the high-level college basketball now I think the veterans are more important to maintain the culture that, this t that the program has built. Yep. And so you look at what Arkansas did. They brought in some high-level guys, and they had a really good year, and then they had a bunch of come in the portal, and they tanked. And so what Barnes and his staff have been able to do, because of the veteran leadership, they've been able to have really good culture. And so I think if these, these guys that are coming back, the Mayshacks, the Gainies, the Ziegler, can still have that Enam mentality that they talked about is kind of every man is, is about the team, not themselves, then I think you can add these new players and, and, and be able to have success. And that's the remarkable thing about Barnes so far. You look in the transfer portal era, I mean, you never know. If you're recruiting a kid for a longer period of time, you have a better sense of his makeup, what, what his background is, who's coached him, who's raised him, how he's going to be when the chips are down. If you're going out into the portal and you're just grabbing, oh, we need a shooter, here, grab this guy. Yep. They may have some background with these guys, but it's not going to be what you would have through a full recruiting process. It's very dangerous for Barnes or anybody else when you're going out and bringing guys in because he does have a template. But, boy, in the portal era, you're always teetering on the one year where it just doesn't mesh, well, where the chemistry just doesn't go. That's why it, <clears throat> in my perfect world you bring in two guys a year yeah. and you're not having to bring in – Four guys a year. Yeah, well, well now, the, the, the template for coaches of the past, it used to be more the template of what you do once you get them into your program. Yeah. Now the emphasis for the right coaches are the template of how do you recruit them. Do you recruit the right players? Do you recruit the right character? you got to spend more time on that because once you're in there, you got them for a year. And it, yeah. like you're saying, if you got seven oh. new guys and three returning guys, the, 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 the scales tilt to the new guys, and if they can, yeah. they can rock the boat to where you have a, a struggling season. Well, throw NIL into it, and how come I'm getting more minutes and playing better, and this guy's getting more money than me and all that other stuff. Well, you, it's why you see another, yet another young national championship coach walked away this past week in, uh, in, in Virginia. So it's amazing that Rick Barnes – uh, continues to charge forward in this. It's basically him and Tom Izzo in terms of the old guard that are really highly successful. Those two continue to maintain uh, in the face of all these changes. Let's talk about the changes next and how what impact the, the uh, portal plays and all that stuff when you're trying to make projections. When we come back, we'll talk, you know, what are the expectations for this team? Should we even be talking expectations? Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Madisonville Marine. There are still some great rebates available at Madisonville Marine. 
Um, check them out before Halloween, folks. Rebates up to f up to and over $5,000, depending on the boat you buy. Get to Highway 411 North in Madisonville to visit my friend Joe Special and all his crew. They'll take superb care of you, I promise you. There's no better place to buy a boat. All right, let's remind folks of the poll, if we can, real quick. Let's see how that's going. Oh, we've flipped it. Okay, now the winning, the winning line is Hypel, winning with defense. That's the one that surprised you the most. Second place, is that 27 or 21 percent? And 27 percent for improved secondary, 22 percent for average pass attack, and 7 percent say that Samson's production. You tell us what's the most surprising thing about football season so far for Tennessee. Keep clicking your smartphones there. Back with Mark Pankratz and Tyler Ivins here. Gentlemen, and I brought you in, Tyler, because you're the big gambler. You enjoy the prognostication of it all. Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. allegedly. All the prognostications. Was the, the pink suit coat. Well, that I was a gamble. Take care of, yes, this. This is Flash <laughs> and yes. for breast cancer awareness. Yes. Real, real men wear pink. All right. Yeah. Uh, here's the gist. You look at uh, the preseason projections. Tennessee's the three seed in the East. They're a three seed in the West, depending on who you The Athletic has them in the West. Mm. Uh, Lunardi has them in the East or vice versa. Golly, bum, man. That's tough to be making these projections. One, you don't know that you're going to get them right in football with the NIL. In basketball... You bring in four guys in football, that's four guys out of 85. Four guys in basketball, you you got a rotation of seven, that's a pretty good mm -hmm. chunk. And everyone else is doing the same thing, too. It's hard for me to wrap my head around how good these projections are. You look at the AP preseason poll last year, they got in the top 20 teams, they got 11 right and nine weren't ranked. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're 50-50 in terms of this stuff. Is it fair to go in with expectations for Tennessee this year? You look at the talent. You have no idea how it's going to mesh. You don't know how it's going to mesh with the new talent all elsewhere in the SEC. Is it fair to set an expectation of blank, and what is the expectation this year? Um, is it fair to set the expectations? Yes, because there are teams out there. If you have talent, you have talent. I will say this, though, and I think this is really, really important. Uh, last year, there is still a player on this current roster who I have NIL back and forth with, and I just asked him. What's this team going to look like this year? And I've even gone back and asked him a similar question, still a part of this year's roster. And he could not be any clearer. Last year's trip to Italy, when they went overseas for that summer trip they always mm -hmm. take, was so important for what they wanted to do, team bonding. Talking about how quickly Dalton connect and how quickly a lot of those other transfer portal players came in and how they meshed. So I think just experience more of these exhibition matchups, more of these private scrimmages like Davidson, as you already referred to, those are so massive. But from an expectation standpoint, another example was Lamont Paris in South Carolina last year. They were supposed to finish 12th, and he goes to the transfer portal, things get clicking, and they were a thorn in Tennessee side at home, and they had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them in Carolina to win the SEC last year. So it's a little hit or miss. But if you have talent like these top 15, 16 teams projected, it's going to end up rising to the top. Well, you also – but okay, but you also mentioned Eric Musselman in Arkansas last year where yeah. it didn't rise to the top. Yeah. So, it's all right, expectations. What should they be, and are they are they fair, first of all, at this point? Or is it more – it's more crapshoot than ever, in my opinion, but you can tell me if you disagree with that. And then you also tell me what the expectations should be for this team. I, I think it's fair. I think it's the necessary evil of That's building of business, success. Yeah. That, that, that is part of it. Um, do I carry much? Do I give it much weight? No, um, but I, th I think this team, because I, I look more at what really I put it on Barnes, and I think mm -hmm. if I look at all these different teams and the culture that he has consistently built, if with the character and the talent that he keeps bringing in, I'm gonna bet on Barnes, like you said in the break. Like, all right, we could pick preseasons, and Kansas is gonna probably be there. Yeah. UConn's gonna UConn probably be there. there. Duke will be and there. I think yeah. with what Barnes has done in his tenure, I think he deserves to be there. And this is no shot on 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 Coach Pearl, but Auburn. You look at their inconsistencies. He's continued to bring in talent, mm. but I think he's had some a lot more inconsistencies. The Musclemans of the world, whereas Barnes, every year he's pretty much been there. Well, and another guy that you got to put up there is kind of the Nate Oates, who was a guy who last year completely, he's on your side, he brought in an entirely new roster. Right. He had new assistants and everything, and it all kind of fired together and worked last year. So you never can tell. I just think it's tougher than ever to look at it and go, oh, yeah, we should be a three seed. I don't know. Let's see. I want to give me a month of watching these guys play together. Well, and I also think that the fans have to understand that some of these preseason games, these early season games in basketball, in a 35 season mm -hmm. uh, 35 sport, game season. 35 yeah. game season sport, coaches are figuring out how guys can play together, what play calls, 
what offenses, what defenses, no. and it's not You're going to be to the go same. Undefeated right. and win by a hundred every but, game, uh, and it's not supposed to be the same when you have a Dalton Connect and it, you can run different things than you can potentially when you have this type of makeup of a team. So fans are going to see these first ten games, and it may, other than defensively, that'll always be the same, but offensively, it may look different, and fans just have to let this play out. Remember, Enough. Dalton Connect didn't shine last year to the ACC SEC showdown with North Carolina. Yep. A lot of people saw him in Maui going, We're supposed to be this big Dalton kid. <laughs> and then Chapel Hill happens. Everybody goes, Oh, oh there it is. Yeah, that's 10, the 11 games into the season. Yep. All right. When we come back, the sport of basketball is changing quite a bit. Is it changing for the better? We'll talk about three point shots taking over the game. Come on back on the Sports Source. Welcome back. This segment of the Sports Source brought to you by Daniel Hood Roofing. Winter is coming. That means wind and that means rain. Is your roof ready for another winter? Find out by having Daniel Hood Roofing come do a free inspection, no obligation, of your roof. If it's fine, great. Does it need to be replaced? Does it need a refresh or repair? Daniel Hood Roofing can tell you. DanielHoodRoofing.com to learn more and to read about a half million testimonials from your, your neighbors here in East Tennessee who've used Daniel. Hood roofing. All right, let's see the final results on the poll we gave you last week. Okay, it's Hypel winning with D was the winner. And second place winds up being the improved secondary, followed by average passing attack, or the average pass attack, followed by Samson's production. So most of you are surprised <laughs> that Hypel is winning with defense. If I had to vote, it would have been the average pass attack. That's yep. the biggest surprise to me, that the passing attack hasn't been better. All right, I've got a cousin who's coached basketball his whole life. He was director of analytics at the University of Memphis last year on Penny Hardaway's staff. He will hate me for even asking this question. <laughs> is the three-point boom, it's changing the game, is it ruining the game of basketball? I was at the Celtics opener this week. I needed a mental health break for 20, 36 hours. They shot 61 threes. You look at Alabama and what they're doing. Nate Oates, who Danny White once hired at Buffalo, they just chuck up the threes. Golden State started this, but they had a generational shooter in Steph Curry. Now, though, everyone's doing it. They're doing it so much in the NBA that, that you were exploiting the efficiency. It was, it was more efficient to shoot threes than twos. Now so many teams in the NBA are shooting all the threes, it's become more efficient to go to the twos after <laughs> last season. Is it ruining the game to where it's no longer about getting an inside, it's no longer an inside out, it's basically just first one across half court, fires up a three? Is it hurting the sport or no? I think it's changing the sport. I don't know if it's it's hurting the sport because people are still still tuning in. Um, there's a lot of other things I think are ruining the sport: mm -hmm. <laughs> the the lack of physicality, uh, the 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 open space where you're not allowed to defend and and get up into guys and make it. So I think there's other things, um, but I, I think it's it, it's coaches that are trying to. Um, make their best players feel a certain way as opposed to playing team basketball at the NBA level. Mm. College is different. That's why I still love college basketball yeah. and high school basketball yeah. because but it's more it's, team focused. But, but NBA, it is trickling down into the – I mean, with Nate oh, Oates doing it, you're seeing more and more teams mm. jack up threes. Rick Barnes' his teams are shooting more and more threes as we go. So I'm just wondering if this is something that you feel – again, all games change. All games evolve over time. There was a time when they went – what do you just do? Well, that's called a forward pass. So I get it. Games evolve. You don't have starting pitchers in baseball anymore. It's weird. But do you think this is a positive or a negative? Or do you think, ah, it's a fad. It'll go back the other way. Well, I, I do think, kind of to your point, it, it's a phase right now that we are in. So it, it will change and, and be different. That's why I wouldn't use ruining the game. I, I think the But that makes for a better question on a talk show. No, that's, <laughs> absolutely. But... Uh, and that's why I can go against it, John, as well. So, but I, I do think that it's not as enjoyable. It, to me, it's lazy. Like, everyone thinks they can shoot the three. Um, it, it doesn't, it, it takes away to me some of the skill. Like, obviously, Steph Curry and his ability to make threes has opened up the popularity of it and opened the door for a lot of this. But I also think it has brought in so many uh, unexpected consequences because of it. Guys who can't shoot as well as Steph Curry yeah, exactly. shooting as much as Steph Curry. Right. That would exactly. be an issue. Tyler, your thoughts? I've had many college coaches from the D2, D3 level all the way up to the D1 say AAU coaches are killing the sport because they're encouraging more three-pointers and this is where things are supposed to be starting. I thought Mark knocked it right on the head with the less physicality. 
But if I can put Aren't my... those connected, though, in some ways? If you're not... If everybody's focus is on just shooting outside, well, obviously you're not going to phys- focus as much on being physical inside. Right. And, and I like the old day. I'm, I'm an old guy. I enjoyed watching Bill Lambeer and Kevin McHale knock each other's That's heads off. That's my NBA. Yeah. Ewing versus Lambeer. And you don't and see that anymore. We don't it's see gone. it. Exactly. If I can put my piece of tape over the bridge of my glasses and go nerd here momentarily. What the analytics have shown us is based on a game, college minutes, and NBA minutes, based on time of possession up and down the floor, you're starting to see higher percentage rates for the two-point, but that one-point difference and the lack of, well, the free throw shot not being as sexy anymore, that's what's kind of equating to the results that we're seeing today, which is a shame because in college basketball, Mark, I'm not telling anything you don't already know, to win in March, you got to have great guard play and be able to hit your free throws. And that's why you're seeing it different from one level to the other. And the problem is, is, is TV, social media, they all highlight the long threes, the dunks, it's the dunks highlight, and, it's the highlight bombs, reels. Yeah. But if you talk to any coach, you talk to any recruiter, it's the fundamentals, mm-hmm. it's yes. defense, yeah. it's all the things that help winning yeah. to be able to let be- really great players do those great things. But to your point, all 12 kids on a roster want to be able to do the great yes. things, and nobody wants to just do the fundamental things to help you win. Well, the, the fear is, we've got to be quick here, uh, and this gets to something Tyler's talking about, when you've got – it trickles down. When There's some high school coach out there watching what the Celtics did last year, and they're – They have averaged 51 threes through their first three games this year. That is more than one a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and they won a championship last year, so I was against it, and it won. Uh, (laughs) But here's the deal. Some high school coaches see that, and they're like, well, we're going to do that here. And it goes down to a middle school coach that we're going to do that here. Your level where you're coaching middle school and stuff like that, we're going to do that here. All right. Well, it then comes bubbling back up because kids are used to doing that. We've seen it already. The NFL is having a hard time finding old-time, big-time offensive linemen. They're having a harder time finding traditional drop-back passers. Why? Because they're not coming out of college. Because everything is a shotgun offense now and spread. Why? Because it trickled up Mm -hmm. from the high school ranks where coaches said, I'm going to take my best athlete, put the ball in his hand, and just let him go. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's changed the way the NFL is playing because the grassroots changed. That could also happen in basketball. Well, and, and, to, and, and to bring it back to the UT side, this is why I think Barnes is going to continue to have success is because yeah. he's going to recruit guys with the accountability of, hey, this is how we play. This is what we do on both ends of the, on the court. This is what we're going to do to help each other win. And if you don't want to do that, then don't yeah. become a pro- part of our program. These other coaches, they're just like Floridas of the world. They're going and buying the guys, yep. and, and some will turn out, but a lot of them will, will falter. And that's why I think Barnes will have this team in the top 20 all year. Uh, thanks to all of you, Mark. Thanks for coming by. I know you're going to be a part of our show during basketball season. Hey, it's my wife's season. birthday. If I could just say happy birthday to her. <laughs> happy quick. birthday. Thank happy. you for letting us borrow him. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate thanks it. We'll see you during basketball season, man. You're going over to the game this afternoon? Yes, sir. All right, very good. Uh, when we come back, let's take a look at the Vols basketball schedule this year. I always love the way Rick Barnes schedules, but I've had a couple of people on this show, panelists, tell me that that's eh, not a good schedule this year. The names look good. The NCAA records from last year aren't good. So is it a good schedule or not? Let's discuss that, then we'll get back into football. Come on back. Good deal. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Safety Systems. You know, I watched the original Halloween this week, and there was poor Laurie Strode trying to lock out the boogeyman. But Michael Myers, he just snuck in through a living room window. You see the the curtain blowing there right behind her. That wouldn't have happened if that family had called safety systems. <laughs> Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, the idiots in Scream, they'd have all been stopped with a good security system from VFL J.J. Serlis and safety systems. Folks, this week, if you're watching a slasher movie, just remember, J.J. Serlis could stop them. Safety systems could stop them. Safetysystems.com. Check them out this week week. All right, and check this out right now. It's Tennessee's non-conference schedule. Everybody knows I beat up Tennessee's football scheduling, and I say, why don't you schedule more like Rick Barnes? I love, I brag on Rick Barnes scheduling every year. I think it's fantastic. It, you got some duds in there, sure, but it's always big names. You're going on cool road trips. You're playing good games for TV. It's great. Okay, well, I got in a conversation with our buddy Will West, and he looked at this schedule. I think it was on air a few months ago. He said, ah, schedule's trash. Well, here's the thing. 
<laughs> you look there on this line, Indiana's exhibition, so that doesn't count. I just put that on there because that's today at three. It's not going to be part of the deal. Gardner Webb, yawn. At Louisville. Louisville was eight and twenty-four last year. They're down. It's still at Louisville. I'm interested in that. Montana don't care. Austin P and, and Tyler can go on about his big sky here in a minute. Austin <laughs> P. Austin P, I don't care. Virginia, you just changed coaches. Uh, they made the NCAA tournament last year. You're going to play them in the Bahamas. You'll play either Baylor or St. John's. Baylor made the tournament last year. Only three teams on this schedule are in red. Those are teams that made the tournament. Tennessee Martin, don't care. Syracuse isn't great. It's still Syracuse. Miami of Florida, that's at Madison Square Garden. Okay, I'm into that. At Illinois, that's a good team. That's NCAA tournament. I'm good with that. Western Carolina, MTSU, Norfolk State, those last three, I do not care. Overall, you got the names, but you don't have the records. So, Bob, what do you think? Half full or half empty? If, is this a good schedule If or not? you're going to give it a grade, I'll give it a B. I don't think it is great, but those are good names. And you also got to remember, when you're going out to play somebody, they also want to have to play you. So, did Tennessee get everybody on the schedule they wanted? We don't know. Maybe not. But I think it's, I think it's a fine schedule. Um, Sure, teams are down, but that's going to happen. And as you all talked previously in the other segments, Louisville last year only won eight games, but their team has transformed since last year. Is that the same eight winner as it was before? We don't know. So I think, it, I think it's a fine schedule. I think it's good, not great. Good schedule, bad schedule, or as Will would say, trash. Yeah. Uh, Hot garbage. Love, love Tyler's partner, Will. It is not a trash schedule. It's not. <laughs> Will isn't um, here to defend him himself, yeah. but that's what he said a couple months ago, so I'm holding him to it. We'll tell him in the hallway and on the yeah. air. Uh, but, no, the, Louisville is an example. They're, in one projection, I saw first team out. So that's an improvement kind of yeah. to Bob's point. And uh, Baylor, projected two seed. Well, what if they see them? in the Bahamas. So you got St. John's, another projected tournament team, um, Miami. Uh, th there's, okay. So there, there are tournament teams in Illinois as well. So it is not as good, to your point, as it normally is, but it's not trash. That's my point. I, I, think, yeah. it's I think it's good. I think it's good. Look, I like the names. To me, yeah. there's name brand value in this. Mm -hmm. At Louisville. Exactly. At Louisville means something. Going there to play at Louisville means something to me. So even though they stink, I will give you a little bit of credit for bringing a big name onto the schedule. If you gave me just more, uh, you well, know, you UNC gotta, Asheville, Wagner, I, I just, you know, I, the – Lenore yeah, Ryan. Lenore Ryan. Yep. I, yeah. I know that Rick Barnes has a special place in his heart for Lenore Ryan, but none of the rest of us care. I just don't like those games. So if you've got Louisville. Virginia, Baylor or St. John's, Syracuse, Miami, Illinois, I'll take that. Tyler, is it good or bad or trash? I think this is a good schedule. Now, immediately, the reason why people will say maybe, Will, you categorize this as a trash schedule, Tennessee is in a unique year when it comes to the preseason tournaments. They can't do the Maui Invitational each year. They can't do the Battle for Atlantis every year. This is that odd year of the three rotating years where they have to go just to the Bahamas and take on Virginia, which they were going to try to implement a new offense. If you remember what Tony Bennett said before his retirement at the end yeah. of the NCAA tournament, this is going to have to be a new way of college basketball, and then you see him exiting. Baylor, as you already pointed out, fantastic team from the Big 12, has won a national championship in the last handful of years. And the Johnnies, who, in my opinion, if there was any team that got jobbed out of the NCAA tournament last year, it was what they did in the Big East. They are a tournament-caliber team. I'll keep going through this list. Syracuse is still looking to rebound since they lost Jim Beheim. They're not going to be a good basketball team this year, but they'll challenge you in the challenge. Uh, Miami, Florida, they brought back four teams from their final four team from two years ago, but they were often hurt, hence the reason why behind their 15 and 17 Plus finish. Plus, it's MSG. You're giving fans There's another. Also that. Yeah. And, yeah, the Illinois team with Brad Underwood, you had to agree to a home-and-home. Home. They don't have as much firepower, but a reminder, this is a team that will sneak up and bite you. And, oh, yeah, didn't by they, the way. Didn't they win the Big Ten uh, tournament last year? They did. They did yeah. end up knocking off um, – a great team to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. That Louisville team, yeah. you want to talk about team, we just, that last segment, we kept talking about teams who shoot too many threes. Yeah. They end up hiring Pat Cawley from, uh, from the uh, Charleston team. You want to talk about a team who can absolutely throw up threes? You're going to think I'm nuts when I say yeah. this, but that back-to-back -back stretch of Louisville and Montana, okay. you guys are going to look at this, Tennessee fans will look at it and go, hmm, let's see what we have this year. That's a nice little doozy between November 9 and 13. All right, very good, guys. When we come back, 
with one month of the SEC season to go, what stories, teams, players, or coaches have surprised us? In other words, what were we wrong about in July and August? We'll discuss that next. Come on back. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Games and Things, home theater seating, bars, bar stools, kitchen and dining stools to go with pub tables, Games and Things, folks. Not to mention shuffleboard tables. You like those, don't you, Tyler? Love You're it. big. You want a shuffleboard t shuffleboard Taylor Please table? Say that. Man, can't talk. It's one of those days, folks. There are days when you just wish you hadn't gotten out of bed. Yeah, that's today. Uh, shuffleboard table tables, poker tables, uh, all kinds of tables or tabers. If I'm going to continue to speak like that. <laughs> OurGameRoom.com is where you need to go check it out. Or games in things, because life should be fun. All right, I'm going to sit this one out and just throw it out here for you guys. Uh, we're two-thirds of the way through the season. Uh, what SEC football stories, teams, players, or coaches have surprised you most? In other words, what did we get wrong, Tyler, in July and August? That Alabama would have a seamless transition from Nick Saban over to Kalen DeBoer. Uh, that's the first one that came well, to mind. Let's just do one each. Let's, okay. Let's, uh, let's uh, yeah, we'll to, go to, around the room. To me, the, the most surprising one is Alabama, even though they lost a little bit to the transfer portal, Kalen, Board, Kalen DeBoer is going to be able to come in and they will immediately be a college football playoff contender. You should already go ahead and mark them in as one of the four and let everybody else like Georgia, Texas, and others, maybe Tennessee, fight for it. Okay. What? They, yesterday against Missouri, that was a hurt team, and I'm still not impressed that they flipped the switch just yet. I mean, you don't even have to go back to July and August to be wrong about Alabama. How many? And, and what are you going to do? I mean, they beat Georgia the way they do, and they look fantastic. Right. Everybody's like, yeah. man, they're not going to miss a beat. And the four weeks since then, woof, it has been a – They've missed a couple of beats. They've missed some beats, <laughs> much like me today. Bob, surprises You know, year. I'm not going to go to the top of the SEC. I'm going to go to the bottom. The fact that Vanderbilt is as competitive – with the top of the SEC as it's been. Now, you can argue now that Alabama's moved down from that, but they hung with Texas. I, I, how did they lose to Georgia State? That'll be at the end of the year. That'll be the Vanderbilt question is how did you let that one get away from you? But the fact that the bottom of the SEC has been improved has surprised me more than the fact that the top of the SEC has been, okay, this week, man, Texas A&M, nobody's going to beat them again. Oh, and then they get beat. Nobody's going to beat Texas. Oh, they get beat. So I, I think that, to me, is the most surprising thing, even though it's not going to play into anything else. The fact that you've got Vanderbilt competitive with literally everybody in the SEC. Vince. Well, that, that's, a, that's a great one. I, I guess I'll go with Oklahoma being so uncompetitive. That was my other one. And, and inept on offense. And, look, I thought they had the toughest schedule. I thought their schedule overall, top to bottom, because of the yeah, SEC they, they got hosed. <laughs> was was yeah. more difficult than even Florida's. It was very close. But they're not even – they don't even look like they belong. They look like Mississippi State in this league. Yes. Uh, so that, that, to me, has surprised me just how – how far down the, the rankings they are and how bad they look. Well, I was picking on Will West earlier for the trash comments about the schedule. Will did pretty much beat up Oklahoma the entire offseason. So yep. I'll give him credit. He did nail that. He saw that one coming. Their offensive line completely – but they've, they've also had – All injuries. their receivers have yeah. been killed. And mm -hmm. their quarterback situation, so much rides mm -hmm. in that quarterback situation. Now, I will go one close to you. I'll just – this isn't necessarily my next big one. I thought Mississippi State might have more punch this year. Yeah. I thought I didn't think they would be the bottom of the league. I thought Vandy would be there. I thought Arkansas may be there. I thought Mississippi State would take a little step up because they got Jeff Lebby from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and they were going to be running the veer and shoot and the up-tempo mm -hmm. offense. Mm -hmm. We saw what it did at Tennessee. We've seen what it does in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. It is kind of a, an equalizer. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been an equalizer for Mississippi State. Uh, in fact, their offense has been pretty lousy for much of the season. So – that one is kind of a surprise that Jeff Lebby, who supposedly, you know, you always hear that, well, Josh Heifel just picked up that system. He, he wasn't born into it the way Lebby was born into it with his father-in-law and everything. Well, looks like Heifel knows it as well or better than Jeff Lebby. That or Mississippi State talent is just so bad that it doesn't matter what system you're running, there's nothing you can do with it. If I want to keep it a little bit closer to home, too, I would have answered the poll question. There it is. Tennessee's defense. There it is. That Josh Heifel's winning with defense. That was – that – here, that is the most surprising thing to me. One, I didn't have great expectations for their defense. And two, if your defense isn't where it is, what are you right now? 
maybe a three-loss team yeah. at this point yeah. if you don't have a defense as good as you've got. I will wrap it up and just say there's, there's one more here, and I'll get you guys to agree on it. I think you could make a case, the biggest surprise, if you, if you had asked any of us before the season, what will be the last SEC team to lose a conference game? Yeah. How many of us would have said oh, Texas A&M? None. I mean, I, we knew they had some talent, yeah. but you're bringing in a, an outside coach. I wouldn't have thought they would be the last man standing in terms of having an SEC undefeated no, record. I thought Mike cool. Elko was a poor hire for so, them. Completely and, wrong. And, and I heard Kirk Herbstreit last night going on and on. He's going to win here, and he's going to recruit here, and he's going to do it the right way, and he's going to do that, and he's going to do this. And I'm like, I hear that about every coach that's hired. Yeah. I'm not all in on Mike Elko yet. I'm not out on him. I, sure. He may be a bad hire. You may have been right in the long term. Great for the right man, now. Yeah. You win no, one game it. last night on television, and it's – if He's we're sitting the guy. here seven months ago, the boar, you couldn't have had a better hire at Alabama than the boar. Five weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> All right. When we come back, the Vols open as a big favorite over Kentucky. What do we expect to see next Saturday night at Neyland Stadium? Come on back. Welcome back to the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Hearthside Bank. Imagine getting everything you need from a bank. Like it's the biggest bank in the world. They got everything you could possibly need. But you get it with the care and attention that only a local bank can provide. Folks, that's Hearthside Bank. They have a long history all across southeast Kentucky and east Tennessee. Now with a branch in Farragut, as a matter of fact. But while they are big, while they have a great long history, they're determined to be your partner as you aim to meet all your financial goals, good people who want to work with you. It is a different banking experience when you bank with Hearthside Bank. Check them out this week. Visit them at hearthsidebank.com. And on a side note, uh, we have, you know, not only we got another thing coming with Sports Source. not only are we now a, a year-round 90-minute show, we were 60 minutes, but we've been here 22 years, we're now 90 minutes. We launched the football, the, the Saturday kickoff mm -hmm. this year, this fall for Saturdays. But we're also launching, I'll show you this, starting in January, the Sports Source Digital Network. Hey. And that is going to be a ton of shows on SportsSource.tv and our YouTube channel involving all of the people here and many of the other people who we have in our huge Sports Source family. That will come in January 2025. It's also going to involve our folks at Hearthside Bank. They're a big part of that, and we appreciate them being part of it. And we look forward to telling you more about this as we get closer to the new year. All right, we've got a couple minutes here. Tennessee opened as a 14-and-a-half-point favorite against Kentucky. Chuck Casino, Casino had him set as 13-and-a-half last Sunday, so he called it a week-and-a-half out. Good job, Chuck. 14-and-a-half-point uh, favorite. Aside from Tennessee trotting out those black uniforms, what do we expect to see at Neyland Stadium next Saturday night? Well, I think you'll see points in the first half. <laughs> I'm not saying we're going to see an explosion. From which or team? Back to the, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, Tennessee, that's true. Uh, so that will be different. I, I also think this will be the, the best, the closest game to looking like we thought they were. I'm not saying it's going to be all the way back. It's a get-well game. Yeah, in, in terms of comfort and margin of victory, things like that, not having mm. to get to the end. I do think Tennessee will win convincingly. And that, that line, 14 and a half, that number will probably go up. Kentucky is the worst offense. They scored the fewest points in the Southeastern Conference. And I, I, I think Tennessee's defense is, is going to be really dominant. A lot of people thought after the second half last week against Alabama that, ten, ah, the offense is fixed. I'm not going to go there yet. I heard that the second half after the, after the Florida game, too. They yeah, figured, oh, yeah, the second, the second half of the Florida yeah. game. But I am going to hang my hat on what Vince just said. Kentucky's offense is a mess. Yeah. It is horrible to watch. And I think Tennessee's defense is just too good. I think you're going to have another game where they score okay. under 20 points. Okay, well, that's where I was going to go. We, we're running out of time. I need to get Tyler right. involved here, too. So Tennessee right. wins. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> there are picks last week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Does Kentucky get double digits? Yes. So they get double digits. They that's score ten. 10 points. Sure. Yeah. I'm not even sure about that. Worst offensive You're league versus this? one of the best defenses. I don't know about uh, that. I think Mark Stoops likes to throw his best haymaker of the year when he takes on Tennessee. I think that the Tennessee offense will sputter again out of the gate. I think Tennessee will figure it out in the second half and will still sit there and go, this is a 30-minute program. Mark Stoops' defense is still 
above par. Their offense might be putrid, but that defense is still going to go out there and give the redshirt freshmen different looks and make people in the stands Saturday night, 7.45, go, what is going on until the second 30? I could see this being 21 to 7. 100%. 100%. I, just, yeah. I could see this being another inconsistent offense performance from Tennessee mm -hmm. and the defense squashes Kentucky. Thanks to all of you guys. Thanks to Mark Pankratz. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Thanks to you for watching. We appreciate you being here every week. We will be, we'll see you Saturday, 11 a.m. right here. We'll see you next Sunday, 11 a.m. right here to talk about pregame Kentucky, postgame Kentucky. Have a good week.